Good evening. I'm going to go ahead and get the program started. And my name is Alex Burden. I'm the executive director of the Harry S. Truman Library Institute. And I want to welcome all of you to tonight's program, which should be a fascinating conversation between Kurt Graham, the Truman Library Director, and journalist and author Evan Thomas. Thank you all for choosing to be with us. I'm um, continue to look at the refresh in terms of numbers. We're over 350. I think that will continue to climb. We had more than 700 registrants from 44 states and eight countries um, for tonight's event. Uh, we've got some special guests with us. And first and foremost, I'd like to welcome our friend David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States and Kurt's, one of Kurt's bosses in Washington. David, thank you for being with us this evening. We were also surprised to get an email uh, this afternoon from a woman named Lynn Burlingham. And Lynn is George Kennan's niece and has written a book about her uncle. So Lynn, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that very much. We've got a great contingent of friends from Washington, DC. A really wonderful turnout uh, for what should be a fascinating conversation. We've got a couple of things that I wanna say about these uh, webinars that we've been doing. I've noticed um, as we, do them more frequently and get a feel for these events. Obviously there's not a reception beforehand. I don't get to say hello and shake hands uh, with the friends that are in the audience. I, I reviewed the list of attendees and I, I highlighted the names of 48 people that I would have loved to say hello to if it was a normal situation. It's not um, hello anyway, uh, virtually. I'm not gonna list your names because I would get the proverbial hook but it's great that you're here. Um, I'm also really pleased with the, the growing engagement of our audience um, through the Q&A function. Our last event, which was a presentation on the Truman renovation, had the best engagement ever. Um, so I encourage all of you to don't be shy about asking questions of Kurt or Evan about the Cold War, George Kennan, you know, whatever's of interest to you. I also want to thank those of you, uh, this is another new dynamic we're noticing and it's growing, but uh, there is an uh, opportunity for you to make a small contribution when you register for these programs. And for instance, tonight, more than 30 individuals have contributed more than $800. That's great. Thank you very much. We love it. And these events that we do for the community, that's not just Kansas City or Independence, but now across the country, are free of charge and will continue to be so, but obviously your charitable support helps us continue to do that. And I also want to thank those of you who are sending me emails in response to the webinars, or also uh, we are doing some new history themed email storytelling. We've had a couple of those emails go out. The feedback's been great. They share resources from the Truman Library and we've gotten a lot of really great feedback. I do my best to respond to every email. I appreciate the compliments and your thoughtful responses. So thank you for that as well. I now want to share some really fascinating, wonderful images with you from the Truman renovation. So if we can move on to the next slide. These are images from the new uh, exhibition, which is about I don't know, 95% done. We're a few short weeks away from being done. Obviously we've got COVID to overcome and uh, the NARA's reopening plan, but we look forward to welcoming visitors into this space really soon. I'm not gonna go specific with the date, but I am happy to share this with you tonight. If the top left image, you see that fractured globe um, that is uh, the way that we are telling the story of the post-World War II war and all of the dramatic incidents and episodes that Harry Truman and his administration had to deal with. So the fractured globe is 14 foot diameter and onto the perimeter of it, we project the, the drama and the chaos and the devastation that took place around the world because of World War II. Over on the right, you'll see another image with the, you know, kind of a, a background black and white uh, film footage on your left and a map of Europe and the Soviet Union on your right. This is our new Cold War theater, which is a immersive experience using a technology called uh, projection mapping. And we've recreated um, a bombed out European city 
and onto the surfaces of some of the, the, the rubble and the wreckage, we are projecting the story of the, the beginning of the Cold War with uh, the expansion of the Soviet Union and the Potsdam Conference and, and Truman's early responses. Then moving back to the, the fractured globe in this room, around the perimeter of the globe, we address Truman's solution to the problems that are presented on and in the fractured globe. And so the image you see bottom left is what happened with the Truman Doctrine and, and also what was going on in, in Japan and Asia following World War II. And the image on your right is the fuselage of a airplane uh, that flew into Berlin for the Berlin airlift. And that's obviously one of the great decisions coming from the Truman administration one of the great Cold War moments um, in 1948. So um, this exhibit is really fantastic. If, um, if you don't know about it, go to our website, TrumanLibraryInstitute.org. There's a section focused on it. We are still raising money for our campaign. So if you haven't made a contribution, I encourage you to consider doing so. There's a great way for you to participate um, if you're into these types of things with a, a brick campaign and you will be able to place your name or the name of a loved one um, permanently at the Truman Library around a statue of Harry Truman. So thank you for those of you who have supported the campaign. It's gone better than we ever imagined. Um, it's a wonderful moment for Truman and the Truman Library. And I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of some of these images. So that's it for my spiel. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for caring about history and and Harry Truman. I'd like to introduce my friend Kurt Graham, the library director. Kurt started, it, I think it was only five years ago. It, it seems like we've been sprinting for, for 10 years. The, the planning started, I think maybe his third day on the job and he's done a wonderful job leading uh, the Truman Library and it's been a pleasure working with him. And Kurt will be um, interviewing a Q&A style Evan. Evan, thank you for being with us. Uh, Kurt, thank you for moderating the program and, and take it away. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that. You know, Alex, the reason it seems to you like uh, such a long time ago is because we were both young men when this, when we started this and that uh, the, the weight of this has, uh, has taken us. I, I want to just uh, make a couple of comments before I uh, introduce the speaker and, and get into the substance of the uh, discussion tonight. I really appreciate that Alex started by sharing that room with the fractured globe and um, the, the Berlin airlift and, and some of the other, uh, the Cold War theater in my mind, that is the heart of the Truman legacy. If I could only have one room in the whole exhibit to really explain Harry Truman's contribution, that would be it. Because I always tell people, Harry Truman didn't just win the war, he won the peace. His, it fell to Harry Truman to rebuild the world, to put it back together. And because he did so in the way that he did, uh, the world we inhabit is fundamentally different. The lines on the map are different. The, the way we interact with other nations is different. All of that because this uh, farmer from Missouri ascended to the highest office in the land. So this notion of the Cold War and the, the, the changing world that, that Truman had, I mean, you think about how devastated Europe was, you know, the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, uh, ultimately the advent of NATO, all of these things are such important um, pieces of his legacy. And you realize that he jumped into this just literally months after taking the presidency, uh, becoming the president. So it, it's, quite, um, it's quite interesting. And I, I'm really excited about the exhibit. I'm glad Alex uh, started us with that because there is, there is nothing like it in the region. There is nothing like it in the rest of the presidential library system. Um, it, is, it is a phenomenal uh, encapsulation of all that Harry Truman did uh, for this country. And I think that at warts and all, and I think people will be very pleased and very happy when, when we finally can open the doors, uh, when, when COVID abates and we can uh, do that, we will do it just as soon as, uh, as we can safely do so. Anyway, on this subject of the Cold War, tonight we are celebrating a 75th anniversary of um, a, a, a very important moment in the development of our foreign policy. Uh, with the uh, with the long telegram that that uh, Kennan wrote in in uh, uh, from the Soviet Union and and sent to uh, to Harry Truman and we're pleased to be joined tonight by renowned author uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, New York Times bestselling uh, Evan Thomas who is uh, 
uh, written for an, and been an editor at Time and Newsweek, um, has been on uh, the programs. I wanted to get this right because there, there were a couple of programs here. Meet the Press, he's been a, a frequent parent, but most importantly to most of our audience is the Colbert Report. This is one that he's been, uh, been a part of as well. So wanted to mention that, but he is co-author with Isaac, uh, or excuse me, Walter Isaacson of uh, uh, The Wise Men, which is really uh, sort of the seminal work on this era and the, 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 the men who surrounded Truman who kind of brought all this, this to bear. And, and chief among these folks or pr principal among them is, is George Kennan. And I'd like to uh, welcome Evan and turn to him and ask him to just kind of set us up a little bit with this long telegram business and, and who was Kennan and why did he decide to write um, and, you know, an 8,000 word telegram that he would send back from, uh, from Moscow to Washington. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I'm delighted to be at the Truman Library. Uh, I've been there before. I'm here virtually. I hope to come back in person. I'm a huge fan of the Truman Library. In fact, all presidential libraries. I, that, that I'm a devoted user of them. Uh, Nixon, Eisenhower, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, uh, they are wonderful national institutions. So thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for giving me a Pulitzer Prize. I never won one. I'd oh. like to, but... <laughs> uh, well, you deserve but, but, one. You uh, deserve one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me talk to you about Harry, Harry Truman for a second. As, as all of everybody knows, he was almost criminally unprepared to be uh, president of the United States, at least as far as foreign policy goes. Right. FDR had met with him all of two times uh, before he died in April of, of 1945. Uh, Truman was never even admitted to the map room where they ran World War II. Uh, he didn't, he was not, had not been told about the atom bomb. And no wonder he seemed pretty overwhelmed. I mean, these famous quotes of him saying, the sun, the moon, and the stars have fallen on me. Uh, FDR ran his foreign policy out of his hip pocket. But Truman had the very good sense to reach out. Uh, there's a quote, he says, I may not have much in the way of brains. Now that obviously was not true, but a typical Truman's self-effacement, I may not have much in the way of brains, but I know enough to reach out to good people and give them responsibility, and he did. Uh, 35 years ago, Walter Isaacson and I, as you mentioned, wrote a book called The, uh, the Wise Men, Six Friends in the World They Made. And I'm gonna, uh, this is a central group that Truman relied on. I'm gonna talk to, uh, about them, particularly about George Kennan, who in some ways is the most intriguing one. As, as a group, the wise men understood one thing. The United States had been an isolationist, isolationist country. After World War II, they won World War II and they wanted to come home. <laughs> as Abel Harriman, one of the wise men said, Americans want to go to the movies and drink Coke. You know, they did not want to be involved in the rest of the world. FDR predicted actually that they would be that way. And so there was a desire to come back from normalcy. There were strikes, you know, uh, raise our wages, feed us. They just didn't want to be involved in the world. And this was frustrating to Harry Truman. He wrote some pretty angry letters or documents that he didn't necessarily mail to anybody uh, about how selfish Americans were. But there was a group that understood that we couldn't just go home again. We couldn't. That Europe was in a rubble heap, a charnel house destroyed by war. The old civilization was gone. The Soviets, the Soviet Union was on the march. They had eaten up Eastern Europe. And if you looked at a map of the world, it was turning red. Uh, Britain, the great peacekeeper, the great Pax Britannica, the ruler of the world, they were broke. They were done for. And there was nobody left but the United States. And these men understood that. And they they, now they, were a, they were not your average Americans. They were quite cosmopolitan. They were bankers and lawyers, diplomats, very confident about America's role in the world. They'd done business in Europe. They'd gone to schools that looked to Europe. They were elitists, frankly elitists. Uh, uh, they weren't really Republicans or Democrats. I mean, some of them were Republicans, some of them were Democrats, but they were kind of nonpartisan. They were confident to the point of cocky. Now, George Kennan was an exception to this. He cast himself as an outsider. 
uh, while, we, while yearning for acceptance. He was a curious blend, a very complicated man, very sensitive and shy in some ways, gregarious in others, uh, sweet but cold, romantic but a pragmatist, uh, assertive and shy. I mean, one of those fascinating figures in history who kind of all over the place. And he is a young man, grew up in Wisconsin, he wanted to go to Princeton because he'd read F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Side of Paradise. Uh, he hated Princeton, and he referred to himself as the most undistinguished student Princeton ever had. Uh, these, the other wise men had been big stars in college, not, not Ken. He didn't want to be a lawyer, he didn't want to be a banker. He joined the Foreign Service, a very clubby place back then in the 1920s and 30s full of Ivy League types. There he was an outsider too. He didn't, he didn't feel like he belonged. And he developed a deep fascination with Russia. Uh, first from the Baltics looking in and then during the war in the Moscow embassy, he became fascinated with the land of the czars about this kind of deep, yet an almost deep romantic relationship to this inscrutable romantic secretive country that just reached his soul. I, that's not, not an exaggeration. And you, Russia was a mystery. What Churchill said about Russia was a mystery wrapped in an enigma inside of whatever it is. The United States didn't know what to do about Russia after they'd been our ally, but they were a communist country. They were seemed to be on the march, and so we went back and forth for about a year. Should we deal with them? Shouldn't we deal with them? Should we bring them in on the secret of the bomb? Shouldn't we? We were kind of all over the place on this, uh, and Kennan watched this from afar from the Moscow embassy. And on Washington Day weekend, 75 years ago, he, uh, St uh, Stalin had given a speech, a kind of a, one of those scary communist speeches. And the State Department said, what do you make of this? And Kennan said, by God, they've asked and I'm gonna tell them. Now, typical Kennan, he was sick. He had sinus problems, uh, his teeth hurt, uh, he had the flu. And he dictated a telegram lying in bed horizontal, he dictated a telegram, the longest diplomatic telegram ever written, 5,500 words, uh, broken into five parts, he said, I think like an English sermon. And uh, it was a, a very stirring message that said the Russians are coming. Uh, uh, they, they are a, a paranoid, secretive group that believes that lashing out at its enemies, it's gonna always try to protect itself by expanding outward. Uh, he said that they, they, it was not just the Marxists, it was the, they were the land of the czars. Uh, this is deeply into their, uh, into their DNA, if you will. Uh, uh, it was a bad combination between sort of old-fashioned Marxism and, and, uh, um, and, 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 and Russian adventurism. Uh, but he wrote in his telegram, importantly, they are impervious to the logic of reason, but highly sensitive to the logic of force. And the way to deal with them is to stand up to them. And if you do, if you do over the long run, they will back down. Thus was born what was later known as the doctrine of containment. This drove American foreign policy for the next many decades. Uh, it was uh, the containment doctrine as it was known. This was, he later amplified that. Uh, in an article he wrote for Foreign Affairs under, under the byline Mr. X, it was, his identity quickly leaked, but his, uh, uh, it was, his article was known and it became basically the origin of, of American foreign policy. Now, when he sent it, when he sent it back to Washington and immediately got an audience, uh, particularly with Secretary Forrestal, the Secretary of War, the Secretary of Defense, he circulated it all over the place. And Kenneth was really pleased. He said, my reputation is made, but he very quickly had regrets. And, and those regrets are uh, important to our story uh, because in Kenneth's view, they missed the nuances. Uh, they exaggerated the military threat of the Soviet Union. And Kenneth wasn't really talking about that so much or he later claimed he wasn't. Uh, uh, but the reaction in Washington is where you have to build up our forces. Now that was, it's easy to see why people did that. There's a, as he later put it, we need to have a, a, the language is a policy of firm containment designed to confront the Russians with unalterable counterforce at every point where they show signs of encroaching upon the interests of a peaceful and stable world. Well, that's how he put it in a paper. You can see why back in Washington, they think that means military force. But he, 
he didn't really mean that. Uh, and he quickly became frustrated with his own product. This was typical of him because it was so, so, so moody. Uh, now, what was the impact on Harry Truman? Truman read it, but David McCullough points out he, the evidence is not that Truman was so affected by, by the long telegram. He later got the long telegram translated, if you would, by, by uh, Clark Clifford and George Elsie, Clifford Elsie report which is sort of a more lurid form of the long telegram, slightly exaggerated form. And that did have an impact on, on Truman. But what really had an impact on Truman was something that happened a year later. You'll be celebrating this uh, a year from now. And this is in February, 1947. And uh, the State Department gets a, a, what was called an aid memoir from Great Britain that says, we can no longer pay to defend Greece and, uh, and Turkey. Uh, and this is the moment when the torch really passes from Great Britain to the United States. And this is where Harry Truman really sits up uh, because he forms an alliance with one of our wise men, uh, a, a fellow named uh, Dean Acheson. Now, Dean Acheson and Harry Truman are one of history's great odd couples. Uh, Harry Truman, the haberdasher's son, plain spoken guy from Missouri, Dean Acheson from Groton and Yale and his bespoke suits uh, with his guardsman mustache, very unlikely combination, but they really hit it off, uh, partly because they both had a sense of history. Harry Truman may have not gone to Yale, but he had read a lot of history and he had a great man theory of history and, and so, did, so did Dean Acheson. And they bonded in a great, one of history's great moments in 1946, uh, before the long telegram. Uh, as, as many of your listeners know, uh, Democrats lost control of the House and Senate in 46. Terrible election, wipeout for Harry Truman. And he's coming back to Washington defeated and waiting for him on the train platform there, Union Station, is one person, Dean Acheson, who's the Undersecretary of State, who thinks we should welcome the president back. And, but, and, and, and is in his morning coat, you know, very proper. Uh, and Truman is so grateful for that. He brings Atchison back to the White House. They have a pop, you know, they have a bourbon and start talking about politics and it formed this crucial bond. Truman and Atchison were men of action. And when the Britons, the Brits said, we can no longer defend the world, Atchison seized this moment and went to Truman and said, we got to do something about this. And Truman by then had had the good sense to ease out his first secretary of state, a guy named Burns, who was a crony of, of Truman's, uh, very smart guy from the Senate, a fellow former senator, but actually not a good secretary of state and all, importantly, not loyal to Truman. Uh, Burns was kind of a freelancer. He was kind of running, he was jealous of Truman, kind of running for Truman's job. And uh, Truman eased him out and replaced him with the sainted George Marshall, organizer of victory in World War II, was a man above reproach uh, as a secretary of state. And, and, and Marshall, like Truman, gave a lot of power to, uh, to Atchison, to his number two. And there's a great scene in the Oval Office when they bring in the senators and, and Marshall kind of blows a speech saying, we got to do something about, the, <clears throat> about defending the world. And Atchison rides in and gives this very bully speech about, this is about tyranny and liberty. And we have to defend, uh, defend the Western world. And the United States has to do this. Uh, and Truman, this is the beginning of the Truman Doc. Truman shortly thereafter gives a speech to Congress and he says, it must be the duty, the role of the United States to defend free peoples when they're under attack. It's a very broad mandate, uh, uh, but it becomes, the, it's, it's, a, it's a partner of the long telegram and the containment doctrine. It's kind of the action arm. The United States is going to do this. Now, Cannon, who wrote the long telegram, reads the speech at the State Department and doesn't like it. He says, well, this is going to get us into a war. It's too militaristic. So the author of the long telegram privately disavows Harry Truman's speech. But by then, Truman's not paying attention to Kennan. He's paying attention to Atchison. 
And importantly, at this very same moment, we're within a couple of weeks, we realize in the United States that Europe is really is collapsing. It's uh, the horrible winter. It's amazing there's no power in Britain. I mean, it's just a terrible, it's like, it's like the winter the Kansas City is happening actually right now, you know, 15 below zero. And and uh, in and, and Berlin, they're saying that the uh, dead envy the living because their hands don't freeze. I mean, it's a really a grim time. And, and Marshall realizes, the new Secretary of State realizes we got to do something about this. And thus is born the Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan is the other key pillar here. The long telegram and containment, the Truman Doctrine, and the Marshall Plan. It has many fathers, including Harry Truman. This is a great Truman moment. Somebody, uh, Clifford, says to Truman, President Truman, we should call this the Truman Plan. And Truman says, no, 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 no. It'll die in Congress if we do. He's smart and politically savvy enough and modest enough to say, no, we're going to call it the Marshall Plan because Marshall is popular. And uh, very, even though it's not really Marshall's plan, it's Truman's plan, it's Atchison's plan. And actually, it's George Kennan's plan because Marshall has had the good sense to install Kennan as the first head of policy planning at the State Department uh, to do long-range planning. And Marshall summons Kennan in and says, we got to do something about Europe going down the tubes. Uh, and his only advice to Kennan is, quote, avoid trivia. That's it. That's his only marching order to, uh, to Kennan. And Kennan writes a brilliant uh, plan. You could call it that. But the, the genius of the plan was, as Kennan says, there really is no plan. The genius of the plan was to go to the Europeans and say, you figure it out. We'll pay for it. But you figure it. So we weren't telling them what to do. Let them come up with their own needs. But, but we'll pay for it. And brilliantly, brilliantly, Kennan realizes, people say, well, don't we have to offer this to the Russians? And what do we do if they say yes? Because they're falling apart too. Uh, and Kennan says, yeah, sure, we'll, well, let's offer it to the Russians. And they'll refuse, which is a very, Kennan, you know, understanding the Russians, understood that they were too secretive. They wouldn't accept. And so we dodged that. And so Kennan had pretty brilliant diplomatic instincts here as well. And the Marshall Plan becomes arguably the greatest foreign policy thing ever uh, because we rebuilt Europe. It cost us billions of dollars. Congress was not happy about it. Uh, now, the tricky part of this is we did have to exaggerate the communist threat to get the European recovery plan through Congress. Dean Acheson had a phrase that stuck with me. Sometimes you have to make things clearer than the truth. And the... Truman administration made things clearer than the truth in order to get ERP, the Marshall Plan, through Congress. They had to scare them. And so they did exaggerate war threats. Uh, now, there were threats, but they exaggerated them. Uh, and we paid some later prices for this by exaggerating the communist threat. But, but it did have the effect of getting it through. And we also, against Kennan's advice, we also created uh, the Western Alliance. We formed a, a military alliance, NATO, the North American Treaty Organization. Uh, it was easier to do things in these days. I was struck, you know, in those days, there was no national security staff. There was no national security advisor. It was, Washington was a much smaller group. You know, it consisted mostly of like Clark Clifford having lunch with Bob Lovett at the F Street Club. I mean, it just, it was a tiny group and they were able to get stuff done. And in the case of the Western Alliance, again, Congress didn't want to pay for this, but Bob Lovett, who was Atchison's successor as number two of state and one of our wise men, he would bring top secret cables to Arthur Vandenberg, the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and they'd have a couple of martinis and talk about it. And that got Vandenberg on board to kind of, now, Bob Lovett was a, uh, he was a Republican, Vandenberg was a Republican, but they are doing the work of a democratic president. Think about that today, right? There was a lot of reaching across the aisle that we just don't associate with modern politics. Uh, in fact, uh, who was it? Uh, FDR used to say when Henry Stimson, his secretary of war was talking to him, oh, I keep forgetting you're a Republican, <laughs> <laughs> which, which he was. <laughs> it was just a different, mm -hmm. whole different mindset mm -hmm. uh, and important to remember. Uh, 
uh, I, I, you know, maybe I, I can go on here, but Kurt, uh, jump, in, jump in here. Well, yeah, let's, uh, this, this is great. That's a great backdrop. And that, that's some really um, very clear, you've made it clearer than the truth, frankly. I mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> very, uh, very well done. But uh, no, I, I, I wanted to say, you know, you, you, you said Oops, you're, you're right frozen. Here. There's a very, they see it as a very binary world. Yeah. They there's do. Socialism and there's communism, or, and, there's, and there's capitalism. So, right. so how do those come together? And yet they're exaggerating on one hand, and yet it seems to me they're oversimplifying in others. How does that square? Well, interestingly, back to our friend George Kennan, he mm -hmm. understood that. Even though he's the one who rings the bell, against the communist threat, the Soviet threat. He's also the first that goes, communism is not monolithic. This is a subtlety that is lost in the feverish 1940s when we're scared of communists. And communists, remember, they steal the atom bomb and they set off their own atom bomb in 1949. This subtlety is lost. Kennan is writing memos saying, uh, this came up in Yugoslavia. Let, let Yugoslavia split off from the Soviet Union. It's not monolithic. He understood over the long run that China and Russia were not going to be monolithic, that they were going to go apart. He was a, Ken was a visionary, but he wasn't so good in the, in the immediate moment. He was too dreamy. He was mm -hmm. too romantic. But, and but, his message got lost. Mm -hmm. But can I ask you, though, in, in, this, in the arc of history, when you think about, you know, from the long telegram to, say, the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, come bring it up to the Reagan-Bush era, and you know, put whatever uh, bracket you want to on the end of the Cold War. Did they were they ill served by not understanding? I mean, meaning subsequent administrations, not just Truman, but w have, was the United States ill served by not understanding the subtlety that Ke Kennan seemed in inherently to yes. understand? Yes, indeed. I mean, this comes up in a variety of ways, even early on. Mm -hmm. uh, Kennan. Uh, washes out eventually, uh, goes off to the academy, and he's replaced by a guy named Paul Nitza, who is more like Atchison, mm -hmm. more of a hard line, get it done. And, and uh, Nitza and Bob Lovett write something called NSC 68, 1950. Mm -hmm. And it's a blueprint for the Cold War to get them, you know, build up our defenses, go get those commies. Uh, and you know, there was a lot of truth to that, but it becomes a blunt instrument. Mm -hmm. And a lot of scholars think, of course, that sets the stage for Vietnam. Actually, they think that the Truman Doctrine is so broad, that we're going to defend free peoples everywhere. Uh, that sets up JFK's inaugural address in 1961. You know, we're going to bear every burden. And we take on too much. This is warned about, actually, by Walter Lippmann all the way back in 1940. He writes a book called The Cold War, where he warns that we're making our, he, we're violating a fundamental rule of foreign policy where our commitments are greater than our resources. We're trying to do too much. And the sad, the tra tragic uh, result ultimately is Vietnam. George Kennan testifies against the Vietnam War in 1966, the Mansfield uh, hearings. Mm -hmm. uh, he was against the Vietnam War. He saw this. Uh, he, Kennan has a famous line, uh, uh, let's see, <laughs> after he, a couple of years after he launches the Long Telegram, he writes that he felt like one who had inadvertently loosed a large boulder from the top of a cliff and now helplessly witnesses its path of destruction in the valley below, shuddering and wincing at each successive glimpse of disaster. This is Kennan's view of his own telegram. He would certainly put Vietnam at the top of that list, the unsubtle view of mm. communist aggression and this idea that we have to protect every now. It, it's a very difficult, and the scholars are still arguing about this, sure. and as they should, mm -hmm. about whether we overdid, did we you know, do enough, did we misunderstand the Soviets. We will argue about this till the end of time. Suffice it to say, we got through the Cold War without a nuclear war, and we did actually contain the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And what happened was exactly what George Kennan predicted in the Long Telegram, that the Soviets would finally collapse from their own internal contradictions, that if we keep them contained, there the contradictions inherent in Marxism and in the Soviet system are going to bring them down. It took how many years from 19, you know, up to 1989 when the collapse really happens? A long time, but it happened. 
just as Kennan had predicted that it would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. And, and you wonder today, you know, about the resurgence of, of, I mean, it's not the Soviet Union, but Russia certainly, you know, and you wonder, um, you know, what, what Kennan would think of that, you know, much, much like you sort of th see the, the German, you know, demise in World War One, and then, and then the rise in yeah. the Second World War, you wonder if there's a, if there's a, something cyclical there that is. Uh, yes, I think, I think Kennan would, would understand Putin, uh, mm -hmm. a kind of a dark Russian for deep in the soul of Russia, not communist. Right. Because Kennan himself made a distinction between communism, which has a kind of a global, and, and, and the Russians who are, have this paranoid, secretive uh, fear of their enemies. That's very Putin-like. Mm -hmm. So nice. there's, there's no doubt that Kennan would have recognized Putin for what he was from the get-go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that strikes me, and, and maybe you can shed a little light on this with uh, with Kennan, is he seemed very keen on educating the public. It was that we have to, and I, I made a note, he said, we have to educate the public to the realities of the Russian circumstance. And, and it was interesting that it was not just leaders, but he felt that citizens needed to be informed to truly understand this. And when we think about civics education today, and just the utter lack of understanding that the bulk of our populace has about any of these kinds of issues. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that to be overly critical. I think it's just a statement of fact. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder what Kennan was on to there because it, it struck me that, that he really felt like this is more than just our leaders. We need our citizens to understand and care about this. Well, he wrote that, he, you know, he does this, the Long Telegram, of course, is a, se is a secret document. Mm -hmm. He wrote something called the Sources of Soviet containment so, so mm -hmm. sources of soviet expansions i'm forgetting the title of his his article yeah. on foreign affairs right uh, which is a pretty narrow publication but it was excerpted in a reader's digest which is mm -hmm. i mean immediately became public and so kennan is you're right kennan saw an important need to inform the public of this he signed his article the sources of soviet conduct i think it's called he signed it mr x because he's a state department planner and marshall said planners don't talk but his identity was quickly outed by the New York Times, by Arthur Kroc. Um, and he, and he, you know, he saw, a, you know, he, he wasn't ultimately a teacher. He wrote a lot. Uh, his own memoirs are, you know, he won the Pulitzer Prize, I think, a couple of times. Uh, so he, he saw, now, one of the funny things about him, though, as a teacher, he was such a beautiful writer that he was kind of mesmerized people. And he was such a romantic writer that he sometimes concealed his own illogic. Mm -hmm. Here's a funny detail. That Dean Acheson, this is Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, when he gets a memo from Kennan, has a mid level bureaucrat at the State Department who rewrites Kennan's memo and put it in bureaucraties so that it would expose the illogic in Kennan's memo. Acheson did not want to be seduced by the beauty of uh, Kennan's rhetoric. He wanted to have read it, reread Kennan's thoughts written by a boring bureaucrat. Yeah. It would expose his logic, and and uh, uh, you know, so so Kennan was kind of dangerous in a way. He wrote so beautifully, he could persuade you of things that weren't not not necessarily true, just by the power of his own uh, sometimes illogical but poetic. He was sure. as much a poet and a visionary as he was a policymaker. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, I wanted to turn. We got a couple of questions that have come in over the chat box here, and and uh, one interesting question uh, is: Was the Telegram uh, encrypted. You know, it was many pages. Was it encrypted, or was it just sent over the you wire? Know, I, I, I'm sure it's not set an open channels, but I don't really know how that worked. There must have been a code. There must have been some way to keep it secret. Here's what I know: the Russian spies got a copy of it. They didn't read it. They they read it because there was a Russian spy in Washington who got a copy from the State Department and sent it back to the Soviet Union. So it must have been it must have been encrypted in some way because the Russians had to steal it as a spy and send it back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about the, um, uh, somebody else is asking about uh, how long did, did Kennan's view of the world, I mean, define our foreign policy? I mean, was it Nixon, detente? I mean, where, where, do, you, where do you sort of bracket the other end of, of Kennan's, uh, what he started? The end of the Cold War. I mean, containment really was our doctrine. There are nuances and arguments. There was in the 1950s, some Republicans believe we should not contain, but roll back. Mm -hmm. you know, push, push it back. That was a bankrupt idea. It never really caught on. 
uh, the, the impossibility of it was exposed by Hungary uh, in 1956. Uh, so there were arguments over containment, but it was essentially U.S. policy reaffirmed by Eisenhower, uh, reaffirmed by any number of presidents, including Nixon, mm -hmm. uh, right up to the end of the Cold War, because it worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, ultimately, the Soviet Union imploded. We never had to go to war with them. Right. We fought a Cold War against them, but they imploded. Mm -hmm. Were, were there any, uh, some, someone was asking, is there any, uh, what was the next best alternative? Was What was the competing thought to Kenneth, to this notion of containment, to this notion, I mean, what what other ideas were circulated yes. that maybe were, had any credibility or any purchase within the administration? Negotiate, deal with the Russians, mm -hmm. uh, trust them to uh, try to, and, and again, the perverse thing, one of the guys purveying that was, this is where our head's gonna spin here, was George Kennan. Yeah. After having erected the containment doctrine, he came up with something a couple of years later called Plan A, which was to negotiate a demilitarized, unified Germany, mm -hmm. where, where the United States and the Soviets negotiate a demilitarized, unified Germany. Uh, and so that was Kennan's idea. It was rejected by them uh, because we were more hard line. We were wanting to save Berlin. You mentioned the airlift, you know, the we wanted to save Berlin from the Russians. We, by then, we, we dug in, so Kennan's idea didn't work. But there was a view, Henry Wallace, uh, Truman Secretary of Commerce, who was a, you know, he wanted to deal with the Russians, to trust them. Uh, there, you know, there's a whole revisionist school that came up in the academy in the 1960s and 70s that said we were way too hardline against the Russians. We could have dealt with them. We could have found, done more to find peaceful coexistence after Stalin died, there was an opening and we kind of blew it by not reaching out to them. Maybe we could have shared the bomb with them. I mean, this, this argument has gone on for a long time uh, and it still goes on in, in academic circles. Were we too uh, hard line with the Russians? Did we miss a chance mm -hmm. to speak to them, to talk to them, to negotiate? Sure, them? sure. As a historian, though, do you find it a little problematic or even almost offensive to sort of I mean, to counterfactually argue, you know, like, well, if we'd only done this, then they would have done this. I mean, there's no way to know what they would have done, right? So, yeah, I mean, look, that's what historians do. Right. Uh, uh, and, 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 and very smart historians do it. I mean, I, I'm not really, I'm not a professional historian. I'm not an academic historian. Mm -hmm. I'm a journalist who became a popular historian, mm -hmm. but I benefit from, hugely benefit from academic historians who make this their life's work. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, you know, it's their job to push the envelope and to try out these theories and see if you can justify them. And even if the theories are not right, they're valuable because we learn about history by trying out these ideas. I think the revisionists, I don't really agree with a lot of what they said, mm -hmm. but they've performed a very valuable service in testing assumptions sure. and making us think about it. Mm -hmm. History is a, history's a moving feast you know right. it's not static right well uh, it's, it's an interpretive act yes. an interpretive act right so we bring we bring different questions and bring new things to it all the time so of course the interpretation changes but but to assert that we know what would have happened if conditions yeah. had been different has always struck me as a little sure but it's it's yeah. fun fun it, game to play and, it, it's uh, job security i mean i understand uh, that. yeah uh, and i'm guilty of it too i, I I'm, yeah. a, I'm a big second journalist or who's who's a bigger champion second guesser than a journalist right right no <laughs> so, i i i understand it's human nature i i engage in plenty of that and in fact one, a question someone asked is you know if as you interviewed those the, the wise men as you were putting your book together if, if you could pick one of those guys to be the leader of our foreign policy today who would you put in charge of if, if we were if you were to name the secretary of state or you know the top diplomat who would you who would you pick from that group the, the, the top diplomat then, Dean Acheson, the greatest mm -hmm. Secretary of State there ever was. Mm -hmm. He had an action bias, so that's a little scary, but he was a very clear-eyed, smart, mm -hmm. brave guy. And he and Truman had wonderful qualities together. Acheson referred to Truman as the captain with the great heart. Mm -hmm. And they were both great-hearted men. Uh, in those days, men were running the show. Uh, but... Uh, you know, they had this kind of brio, this faith in America, this confidence, this willingness to do hard things, to ask Americans for sacrifice in the cause of a, of a, of a greater cause. Uh, yeah, I mean, Dean Acheson, you know, he was not perfect. He was, he could be a little snooty. He was, mm -hmm. 
didn't get along as well with congressmen as he should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a sense of humor after he had testified. This is how had different times were. It, you know, uh, Truman fired MacArthur in 1951. And of course, Atchison had to testify. He testified nine straight days about this. And when he was done, he had a press conference and, and Atchison said, I am now going to test the human capacity for alcohol. Yeah. Can you can you imagine a Secretary of State saying that today? Uh, but it was a different era. Yeah, and uh, you know you can get away with that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know one of the things I find very very interesting about your work and your your take on this is that uh, you know most Americans probably don't think of this except like right now when we have a new administration putting in a new cabinet, or you know in the previous administration we had. Uh, well, we had several new uh, leaders in different uh, key positions because there's a fair amount of turnover, but there's always, there's always this question of who's the best, who are the best people to put around a president? That somehow we have this sense that those who surround the president are very important. They wield a lot of power, a lot of influence. We want you know, good judgment, all these qualities that we care about. And if I read you correctly, I think that you know, as much as we celebrate about Harry Truman and as much as, especially here in the Midwest, as much as we love Harry Truman, I think it's fair to say he would not have been Harry Truman had he not had this council of wise men around him. And I mean, he could was, you speak a little bit to the, to the importance of who a, for whom a president chooses to surround himself? You know, great leadership in the Oval Office is such a delicate mix because you have to be really confident and humble at the same time. Mm-hmm. And the great ones, I mean, like, like Harry Truman and like uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who followed him, mm-hmm. have the confidence to be humble. In mm-hmm. other words, they are so confident, really, about their own instincts and their own, that they're, they're pretty humble. In their own way, they're humble. Mm-hmm. They, can't, they can't be modest. I mean, they're <laughs> leaders of the free world. You know? right. they, they have the nuclear bomb. They're not modest that, in that sense. They have giant egos and big tempers and both Truman and Eisenhower certainly did, but they know enough to know that they need help. I mean, right. as, as, as you know, Truman said, I, 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 he made a self-deprecating remark. I don't have that big a brain, but you know, they, they reach out and, and, and that's, that's really important. Also, they need to know that the Oval Office is a very intimidating place. I remember Bob Strauss, some of your our listeners will remember Bob Strauss, who was a fixer, if you will, a democratic, and he would like to see, he would bring people to see Democratic presidents mm-hmm. and uh, advisors, and they would come and they would say to Strauss, you know, I'm going to go into the Oval Office and I'm going to tell that son of a bitch thing or two, you know. And then they get into the Oval Office and they go, oh, Mr. President, you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> and, you know, presidents are just not leveled with. They're not and so you got to find people you trust to tell you the, the truth. Yeah. And, you know, Tr- Truman cast about for that. He had he had his own cronies in there in the beginning, and he was accused of cronyism. Uh, Jimmy Burns really didn't work out that well. Right. Uh, but, you know, Clark Clifford did. Uh, mm-hmm. So Truman had to, you know, a little trial and error here mm-hmm. to find the people you can trust. It, but it's a lonely damn job. Mm-hmm. You know, the, lo- that, the cliche, the loneliness of command. It yeah. is never truer than in the Oval Office. Yeah. Well, I think you make a great point about, you know, there's a difference between modesty and humility and that uh, Truman has a, a, a kind of true humility that is born of confidence. And in fact, uh, one of our questions, in fact, from Patrick Wilson, who is a, a good friend of ours who lives in, uh, in your neck of the woods uh, back in D.C. And he's, he makes a, mentions your reference to Truman's humility and says, how did American exceptionalism, in other words, our, our collective yeah. hubris or whatever you want to call it, play into the Marshall Plan's sales pitch? And did members of Congress buy the idea that the U.S. should be the global leader, this one essential nation? Um, did, is that something that took root right away or is that something that yeah. we look back and... That's, that's, a, that's a great question uh, and a subtle question. I mean, the initial reaction to the Marshall Plan was the expression I think of the day was, foreign aid, that's sand down the rat hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's not do that. We got a lot of problems at home. We're right. rebuilding the United States from World mm-hmm. War II. We had strikes. We had, you know, housing costs. So, uh, but this streak of American exceptionalism was there nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And in 1946, we had just saved the world from not from fascism. So America was feeling pretty good about itself at the same time as we were isolationists and wanting to come home. 
Right. And, and it's often American impulses are contradictory. Mm-hmm. You can be want to come home, but still think you're the greatest nation in the world. That's not it seems contradictory, but it's not. Right. And, and, and a lot of, you know, American foreign policies, always, we always think in terms about realism and idealism. They clash. Mm-hmm. Kennan was the living clash between realism and idealism. Right. You know, this idea that we got to be realistic about our interests and not get into stupid fights. Or idealism, the United States believes in human rights and freedom and democracy. We have to spread that all over the world. The, that tension has always been part of American foreign policy. In about of America, we've always had that tension in our own country. Mm-hmm. We've resolved it pretty well over the years, but not perfectly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you have to have both. I, I, you know, I think you have to be have to believe in American exceptionalism. It is just a fact. The United States is the greatest country in the history of the world, bar none, not even close, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's even close. Mm-hmm. Have we made huge mistakes? Yes. Have we been unrealistic in our, in our idealism? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. That's our history. But it's an interesting point of history though, with in, in Truman's time in that particular post-war era, that there's a there's an evolution, and you 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 mentioned you sort of hold up Kennan as kind of the living clash of, of this idealism and, and reality. But you know you can think of other people who come home from the war, and I think particularly as the Republican Party goes from in those days, you know, from this sort of Taft uh, isolationism to you know think of the person of Jerry Ford. I mean, Ford comes back from the war. And he is sort of one of these isolationists. And, it's, and I think it's Truman, I'm not maybe personally to Ford, but, but the Truman doctrines and the Truman approach, the canon yes. uh, constructs that really convince him. And, and I think a generation of Republicans, uh, you know, Reagan was a Truman fan in those days as well. I think the Republican Party that I grew up knowing as a, as a young man and as an early uh, voter and whatnot is, is very much the product of this kind of evolution of thinking that's going on at a pretty a pretty good clip, I think, in the 1940s and 50s. I think people are moving very rapidly from one position to another. They are. It's, it's a complicated transition because the Republicans, Taft is an isolationist. The, the, mm-hmm. the Mr. Republican, the head of the party, yeah. mm-hmm. he's an isolationist. He wants to come back to Fortress America. Mm-hmm. But young Congressman Richard Nixon mm-hmm. and you know young Congressman Jerry Ford, they're going, oh, I, you know, I think we have a, to play a role in the world. Right. And they're more in the Truman, if you will, the more internationalist camp. So the Republican Party drifts away from isolationism, not entirely, but mm-hmm. mostly, to become a more internationalist party. And the fulcrum here is anti-communism. Mm-hmm. Because the, you know, the fear of communism from within takes a rancid turn with Joe McCarthy when, mm-hmm. you know, and this is Truman got caught up in this, the loyalty oaths and the loyalty yeah. test. Oh, yeah. Uh, not a pretty time in the United States uh, where we get all paranoid about the Soviet Union and we exaggerate its internal threat in the United States. I mean, there were spies in World War II. There are a lot of Russian spies, mm-hmm. we now know. Yeah. Uh, Venona decrypts and all that. But by 1950, when, when uh, MacArthur is yelling about reds under every bed, we rounded up most of the Russian spies. Mm-hmm. It wasn't re- really a threat, but the country went crazy about it nonetheless. Truman had to, you know, delicately navigate uh, through all that. Right. Uh, hard to get it right. The politics are really complex, and uh, and people have sh- shifting views. Right. Uh, you know, and, and their views evolve. Arthur Vandenberg was an isolationist who becomes an internationalist mm-hmm. uh, during World War II. I think it was mm-hmm. uh, because of the uh, of Hitler. Yeah, no, no, Vandenberg's another great example of that kind of evolution. And I, I just wonder, I think it's, I think that's particularly interesting to us because I think we see some really major shifts going on really in both of our parties in terms of where, where they stand on a lot of key issues. And it's amazing to me the, the celerity with which that has happened. I mean, the, how quickly uh, things have seemed to turn on a dime um, in, 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 both, in both parties, I think, fairly. And so... Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, you know, this, I, this era just informs us in a kind of interesting way that way. It, it does. I, you know, people get upset by that because it seems inconstant and fickle and changeable. Mm-hmm. And why can't we figure it out? I take the opposite approach. Mm-hmm. The United States is the greatest country in the history of the world because it's the most dynamic 
country in the history of the world, capable of change. Right. You know, the original uh, Republican Party became the Democratic Party, which is a name change. Right. Uh, you know, party, you, you follow party evolutions and they go, it's dizzying yeah. um, how much they, they change. And that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. We have adjusted to circumstance. We have evolved. We have changed. We haven't been static. The countries that are static, where there's one ruling class mm -hmm. and they, they are in charge, those are the countries that collapse. That's Spain, you know, right. that's the Soviet Union. Right. Uh, that's, it's the countries that are capable of changing and that are capable of evolution. Those are the countries that thrive, thrive preeminently the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very good. Um, there, there was a line toward the end of the long telegraph and I wanted to kind of, uh, uh, maybe you may get your thoughts on this. I don't know if I captured it exactly, but uh, he, he says that communism is a parasite that only feeds on diseased tissue. Now, that we, we could do a program on that quote, I think. <laughs> we, <laughs> but I just wonder, I wanted to get your thoughts here as, as we get, we're just a few minutes here to wrapping up. I, I wonder uh, where, what is the diseased tissue in the body politic? When you think civically and you think today, and I, I'm not trying to, to, to coax you into a, a making a political statement about anybody or anything today, but just simply, I think that there's this concern that these parasites feed at the diseased tissue. And I think there's a, a concern in our country today that we have some weak tissue, we have some weak points, and there are, there are parasites feeding on them. How do, we, how do we go about that? We, we do. I mean, we have a big trust problem. You know, we, mm -hmm. we've lost, lost faith and trust in institutes. The biggest problem is we don't trust our own institutions. Your, your, our viewers have know these polls, you know, 1963, 60, 70, 80% believe in government. They believed in the Supreme Court. They believed in the military, blah, blah, blah. You look at the, the Congress, the press, you look at those numbers today, it's 10%, 12%. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. we've lost, so that's, that is a big problem. And with it, a lack of uh, civic knowledge, a lack of civility, we have big problems. However, as my friend John Meacham likes to point out, we have had big problems before. Mm -hmm. Harry Truman had big problems. Mm -hmm. He had them in the Soviet threat. He had them with Joe McCarthy. You know, he had a lot of big problems. And uh, Abraham Lincoln had a lot of big problems. George Washington had a lot of big problems. I like one of the great things about history is that it reminds you if you if you're, if you're reading history, you're reminded that however terrible things seem now, <laughs> they're pretty terrible ten years ago or twenty right. years ago. I mean, you know, the good old days. Well, when were the good old days? Were they, you know, the, 19, the teens when we were fighting World War One? How about the 1930s when we had the Great Depression? Mm -hmm. 1940s when we had World War II? The 1950s, supposed to be a great time, but, mm -hmm. you know, threat of the atom bomb. The 1960s, the country blew up. Right. The 1970s, Watergate. You know, what were the, what were the, tell me what the good old days. Well, and then, and then if once you define the good old days, tell me for whom were they the good right. old days? I mean, exactly. there's I mean, there always winners and losers in every in every era at every time. Exactly. And one thing about our age is that we are coming to grips painfully mm -hmm. with the fact that 30% of the of our civilist of our populace had all the power. I mean, you know, until the late 60s, mm -hmm. white males had the power. Yeah. Women did not, mm -hmm. and non-whites did not. So 30% of the country had the power since the late 60s. We've tried to do redress that. It's painful. Mm -hmm. The white males are mad. Mm -hmm. You know, they're mad about the loss of power. The country is riven and and going through a tribal and difficult time. It is, but that is a necessary passage from mm -hmm. thirty percent to one hundred percent. It's it's the giving fulfillment to democracy. Right. We're going to get from here to there. It's a little scary at times. I got to say, mm -hmm. but I you know I just have faith that we're going to we're going to. And I think Harry Truman would have faith. That we're going to get there. Yeah. Well, no, and I think that your, you know, your work is so inspiring to those of us in the Truman business because, you know, it's because of people like Truman and the people he surrounded himself with that we do get through these difficult times. They 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 show us a, a way. They 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 mark a path, and uh, it's it's very uh, reassuring, I think, to look back and realize that no, he didn't get everything right. I would not sit here and say that I think Harry Truman was perfect by any stretch, but he certainly. Uh, made decisions, I think, from a good place and, and did his best to move the country in what he thought was the right direction. I agree. Yeah, very, very good. Well, listen, Evan, this has been a thrill to have you here with us. Uh, 
a big fan of, of your work and your whole demeanor and the way you lay this out. It's been great. And I am going to put you in for that Pulitzer Prize, by the way. I think it was an oversight <laughs> on, on, Thanks, the committee, on the committee's part. So I will I'll do my best to address that. And we hope to see you in uh, Independence in Kansas City sometime I'll, in the near future. I'll be there. Thank both you for your Kurt. research and, and as our guest. We'd love to have you. Thank you for having me. Very good. Bye. Thank you.